In Ableton Live 11.3, there's a new synthesizer called Drift. And Drift is meant to be extremely expressive and to capture the inconsistencies and warmth of real analog hardware synthesizers. And if you've paid any attention to the sound design work I've done in my hundreds of Ableton Live packs over the last few years, then you can probably guess that I love Drift. I've been designing my own presets for Drift for the last couple weeks, and it's incredible. Right now, you're hearing me improvise on some of those presets I made with Drift. I've got a free pack of 10 presets that you can have for your music over at brianfunk.com drift. It even includes a 16-pad drum rack where each drum sound is made up of a Drift preset. But I actually made 50 different presets. And all 50 of those presets are only available to members of my music production club because you guys are my biggest supporters. Members of the music production club always get my newest creation as soon as it's released. My educational materials, including video courses, my books, helpful PDFs, and they're part of a really cool, supportive community of fellow music makers. And I love that community. We have a Discord server where I get to hear people's music. We get together and hang out for live Zoom meetings, share our music, share tips, do projects together. It's so much fun and really exciting and inspiring for me to share this community with everybody. And there's also bonus materials for the Music Production Club, which are basically just free stuff from my store that I put on there every once in a while. So if you want to get all 50 of these Drift presets, sign up for the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com mpc. I'm really proud of these presets. They're so expressive and deep, and some of them have maybe a reverb or a delay on them or maybe an arpeggiator, but almost all of them are just drift itself without any effects. It's amazing what you can do with this synthesizer, and I had a lot of fun making these sounds, and I think they're gonna work really nicely in all kinds of different music genres. So if you wanna get your hands on 10 free drift presets, go to brianfunk.com drift. If you want all 50, join the club brianfunk.com slash mpc thanks a lot and enjoy this episode of the music production podcast hello everybody welcome to the music production podcast i'm your host brian funk and this is the show where we talk about all things making music and today i have lanier salmons on the show lanier is an engineer composer teacher he works at california state university in monterey bay he's does mixing, mastering, film scoring, installation work, concert hall pieces, and some podcast themes as well. Um, Lanier and I got to meet when we were on the Monterey songwriting retreat a couple weeks ago. And if you've been listening to the show, you heard my conversation with Peter Bell, where we were both on that, and Peter and I were roommates. And Lanier was on Peter's team for the songwriting retreat. So um, we had a great time and... Um, Enjoyed talking to Lanier while I was there, and I'm really happy to get to sit down and spend a little more time. So, Lanier, welcome to the show. Good to see you again. Thanks so much. Really happy to be here. And, uh, yeah, big fan uh, of the podcast and also the music you're making, of course. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah. Um, loving what you're doing, too. Um, thanks. Your work is lots of cool elements to it. Um, lots of There's guitar. There's like kind of mm -hmm. like rock stuff, but then there's like kind of like um, almost orchestral, I'd say, elements and... Sure. Lots of yeah. nature in there too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of uh keeping things in multiple directions and uh yeah, yeah. Makes it more interesting for me at least. <laughs> yeah, right. I I don't know if that's sometimes to my detriment that I like to go in lots of different directions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't know. Um there's so much you can do with music, right? So Yeah. Yeah, there was this uh the production expert, you know, that blog. Um article a couple weeks ago that was was uh, about how we shouldn't all try to be jack of all trades and i felt a little personally attacked but uh yeah. i think it's kind of more fun that way right and uh, i like all the challenges yeah well i guess there's like a million different jobs you do sometimes even just yeah. producing one song in any genre you're sure. wearing lots of hats and then if you're gonna do lots of genres it, it is tough like, like, for instance, the last couple of nights, my wife and I have been trying to watch horror movies because mm -hmm. it's getting sure, into sure. Halloween it's season, so we're having fun with that, some of the campy stuff. But <laughs> we were looking at movies by Stephen King, mm -hmm. like 
just um, as the search basis. And um, y if he would suddenly have had like a film that was not in w that genre, we would be yeah. like, hey, what's going on? Even though I know he does some writing like that. But yeah, um, I yeah guess the Stephen like, King romantic comedy would be, uh, yeah. I, I don't know, I'd probably watch that actually. <laughs> that sounds pretty good <laughs> if I'm going to like a romantic comedy. <laughs> But I guess from the audience perspective, you do come to expect certain things from artists. Sure. But yeah, I'm with you. It's just more fun to <laughs> spread your wings and explore the world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I do worry sometimes if, you know, I think there's something to be said about having that identity that folks can uh, can attach to you and go to you looking for um, and, and yeah, I wonder, you know, how much your audience will go with you. But uh, I'm also fortunate in that a lot of the work I do is sort of not not as much, you know, attached to my own name as it is, you know, other artists or it's a film project. And, uh, you know, mm. I think maybe that maybe that helps too, right? It's an excuse to to stretch out. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a cool aspect of working with other people and yeah. organizations and stuff that you get to try weird things. Right. I've definitely had some fun making music for, you know, situations I never would normally do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you learn a lot that way. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of like um, the production techniques too. I, I've, you know, I found so much about like EDM is online and there's how to make like all everything. And it's not really the type of music I make, but mm -hmm. a lot of it applies to mm. other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to add spice. Yeah. I always feel like with the teaching too, there's, um, you know, anytime I'm going in some direction, even if it doesn't turn into something I'm going to use, there's probably somebody sitting in my class that'll find that thing useful. And uh, mm. yeah, that's another another good excuse to uh, to pull on all those strands. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that is one nice thing about teaching. Is right, it takes you into unexpected places, and even if it's just the questions your students ask, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, oh yeah, let's see, let's figure that out. <laughs> Yeah. So you're teaching at California State University, Monterey Bay, right? That's it. CSUMB. Yep. So uh, you tell me about that. What kind of classes do you teach? What kind of work yeah, are you guys doing? Absolutely. My um, my official title there is uh, Associate Professor of Recording and Technology, and I'm in a music program. So it's uh, it's a little unusual. One of the things you mentioned the the episode you did with Peter and and you two were talking about. Uh, a bunch of the ways that Berkeley is really distinctive in being a spot where where tech is you know kind of foregrounded and built out, mm. um, and we're fortunate at CSUMB to kind of have the opportunity to do that. I think in a much different way. I mean, we're we're tiny compared to Berkeley, um, but we've got a uh, you know pretty commercial grade studio set up there. Um, the campus used to be Fort Ord, um, and we are in a building that was a chapel. So we've got the you know the big uh, chapel space as the live room. And, yeah, yeah uh, big old. Uh, well, it's not that old, but uh, old looking MTA nine eighty analog console, forty channels, second control room with a, a hybrid console, a matrix remote, um, and you know a bunch of outboard gear, monitors, a surround setup in a different space. So it really is a chance to um, kind of really teach and for the students to learn in a, a genuine studio setup, which I think is a little bit different than a lot of other schools. You know, everybody's got their music mm -hmm. tech offering, but a lot of times I think it's, you know, sitting in a lab and you learn Audacity and maybe GarageBand. And this is a little different than that. <laughs> yeah, that's been a nice change that's starting to happen and has been happening maybe the last 10 years or so. And mm -hmm. schools recognizing that this stuff even if in like from the perspective of like a bedroom producer yeah. is, is legitimate. I mean, there's right. been great music made that way. And yeah. I love that it's being embraced. Absolutely. Yeah. Another thing that I think is distinctive about us doing music at CSUMB is there's not a audition requirement. Um, so a lot of folks come in, not really, uh, you know, in many cases, their primary instrument is really the doll, you know, um, and they'll, you know, once they're with us, they'll, they'll take a couple semesters of piano and, and do some other performance for sure. But, um, we get folks coming in who are, you know, pretty virtuosic on their instrument and folks who, uh, who really haven't, uh, spent that much time, you know, with an instrument in hand at all. Um, so there's a, there's a, a tech entry point too, which, um, mm. which I think isn't always there other places. Right. And really like you don't need to play an instrument 
mm-hmm. to make music anymore. Somehow along the way that, that it, <laughs> you know, producing music has been like democratized where yeah. you don't have to have that. Absolutely. It's helpful, of course. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it's another instrument in itself. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's a, a strong argument for, for DAW as instrument, you know, for, uh, for it really having its own kind of like performance practice. And, um, uh, but at the same time being something totally different, because for so many people, it also is a, like a non real time performance practice then, right. You know, you don't right. have to uh, make the decisions and execute them in the moment in the same way. Um, but yeah, I think that stuff's super interesting and, you know, very curious, uh, the AI question seems natural here too, right? Like, is that going to even further democratize what it means to make music? And then, you know, yeah, inevitably, I guess, what does that mean for the rest of us too? <laughs> yeah, democratize it so much that like, <laughs> it, like you don't even need a person to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that seems tricky. But, uh, you know, mm. I'm sure I'm sure we'll all, uh, we, we don't have to stop just because the machines do it well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, people still record to analog tape. For Absolutely. Fun, yeah. Because you know, because it's got a certain charm to it, and um, yep. the we don't lose the tech. I mean, maybe it's harder to get some of that old vintage stuff, but it's not mm-hmm. like it disappears. It's not like yeah. we're trading it. Absolutely. Yeah. Though I did have a uh, sobering moment last last semester. I was teaching a student who wanted to do an independent study on sort of like working with vintage media, and I thought, all right, we've got you know, a couple tape machines around the department. There's some other stuff. And uh, like our first or second meeting, he brought in like a Tascam four track cassette player. That's the same one I had when I was a kid and was like, here's cool. my vintage, <laughs> vintage media. <Yeah. laughs> like, all right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling the generation gap. My, uh, my original is vintage now. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you remember what machine it was by any chance? Oh gosh, I'll forget the number. So it's uh, it's a Tascam and four track, you know, straight to cassette. Um, yeah. I it's it's sitting behind me in the closet somewhere. I've still got it around. They probably haven't plugged it in in a decade. But uh, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. I, I had one of those too. That's why I asked. It was the mm-hmm. cheapest one you could get. It was mm-hmm. the advertised as the meat and potatoes four track. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. It was. I think it only had two inputs. Hmm. Yep. And um. Maybe maybe even two faders, and you had to switch between them with a little slider that kind of. Mm, mm-hmm. That's possible. I could be wrong about that, but <laughs> um, oh, it was so much fun though. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, were yeah. great, uh, great things to learn on too, right? You, uh, yeah. You had to figure out some stuff about signal flow, and you know, actually, uh, yeah, old school bouncing between tracks to get more than four things on there, and. Yeah, I don't think mine had that feature. Oh, okay. I don't think it had like that. Yeah. I think meat and potatoes for Sure, so. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 But I vividly remember when I first set that up, I started playing all the guitar parts to um, The Rooster by Alice in Chains. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is amazing. It's so <laughs> fun. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. Yeah, I remember trying yeah. to record my... Uh, like middle school band in there. So I'm like, all right, I've got four tracks and I've got a drummer, two guitars, a vocalist. I think we didn't have a bass player at that point. I was like, all right, I've got one mic for my drums. Where does it go? Yeah, <laughs> right. Just hold it out. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you learn so much like that. Um, yeah. It never occurred to me until I had one of those that it matters where you put the microphone. Sure. And it taught me all about you started to realize like where you got cooler sounds yeah. <laughs> stuck it in in certain spots. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I, I started experimenting with some outboard gear when, uh, when I had that too. And I had like a little multi effects unit that totally taught me, you know, like to understand reverb and delays and things like that. Uh, and I also vividly remember, um, my dad came home one day with, uh, with this little box and was like, Hey, I went to the music store. I asked him, you know, like what, what should you have? And he was like, he told me, uh, this is a compressor and this is the sound of contemporary music. Um, <laughs> and I like, I, I plugged some stuff into it, twiddled some knobs. And it was like, I, I can't hear that this is doing anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, like 14 year old me did not have the ears to, uh, to understand what, uh, what compression sounded right. like yet. And, but uh, yeah, a, a great introduction to it and a good reminder when, you know, 
students show up in the classroom and it's day one of compression. And they're like, I, I can't hear this. I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I remember. <laughs> yeah. <Get there. laughs> I have, um, what is it? The Alesis, uh, 3660, I think it is. Hmm. No, I'm sorry. It's not, a, is it Alesis? It's the 3660. I forget. I can't see the name on it, mm -hmm. but, um, it's like a dual channel compressor and, I got that later. I by then I had eight at machines that nice. were mm -hmm. already kind of old by then by the time <laughs> I got them. But mm -hmm. and I understood I was supposed to use the compressor on everything. Yeah, for right. some reason, and, <laughs> um, I had no idea what I was doing. I probably <laughs> ruined so many recordings with it. <laughs> but I didn't understand even what the idea was, what the process, what yeah, it what was even right. for. You know, I I was. Yeah. It was just makes it sound better was what I was told. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Very vague. <laughs> it's a great point though to remember what it was like at those early stages. Mm -hmm. um, I had a club at my school, music production club. Oh, at, wow. The high school I teach at. Yeah. And um, I get students coming all the time and like you really have to ask them like, do you, mm -hmm. do you, are you familiar with like bars and beats? Yeah. Quarter notes? Right, and, right. Some of them, they know it. Some of them know it better than me. And some of mm -hmm. them, some of them have no idea. So it's like, okay. Yeah. And yeah. I'm reminded of my grandmother, actually, when she mm. first got a computer. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to show her how to like go to AOL or something <laughs> to get email. And I'm telling her, okay, so you just move over here and click on that. And the idea of move over here and click on that with a mm -hmm. mouse like what is what do you mean click on it like yep, just yep. terminology simple things that you take for oh, granted absolutely. yeah that um there's yep. so much of that in learning music yeah that's one of the things i think uh you know always trying to grow as a teacher hopefully in various ways and i think at this stage i've been i've been at csumb for about 10 years and you know a lot of the same classes over that time and i think that's the the biggest thing i'm trying to keep on my radar is uh an awareness of where my own familiarity um, might get in the way of teaching it, you know? Like you, you can't yeah. just, uh, you can't throw out those terms without making sure you explain them. And, you know, hopefully we've got it built into the class in a good way. But uh, like you were saying too, sometimes students drop into the classroom and they've they've been doing this and watching YouTube videos and, you know, listening to podcasts like yours and they, they know a lot of what's going on. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wide range on that entry point. Mm. Yeah. yeah, especially at DAWs, because you, you kind of have to mm -hmm. know computers at least a little bit. Yeah. File structures and sure. stuff like that. And yeah. Yeah. And it's funny how music gets you involved in all these other side <laughs> missions. <laughs> like right. Absolutely. Everything from web design to mm -hmm. marketing and yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, computer I, specs. Yep. I picked up a soldering iron for the first time in music <laughs> grad school. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I've. I've Mostly unsuccessfully tried to fix a lot of guitar cables that way. Yeah. <laughs> I but, made um, some uh, some contact mics that I still have around and, and oh, use for nice. various things. And uh, they're still working like 15 years out. So I think I did okay. But uh, I, yeah, I, I now know enough to know that they were ugly solder jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my one successful soldering job is somewhere over here. Um, it's a little bit out of reach, but it's... It's a telephone that's turned into a microphone. Oh, cool! So with yeah. an XLR kind of soldered in. Nice. Which is really simple. It, it's yeah. it's two soldering points. So you cool. just two wires, and, and um, the way mine works is you actually speak into the the ear phone mm -hmm. part of the phone, yeah. and um, nice. It's got such a cool sound. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd be curious to hear real, it. I'm curious how colorful. You know, like it, I, I've got the landline sound in my head still a little bit, but I imagine curious how much of that is the actual receiver and how much of it was transmission, you know? Yeah, right. I I guess uh, I guess some of it must be transmission, but a lot of it does come out of that. Cool. That trans, that whatever it is in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. The, um, it's, it's, it's a worthy, uh, little afternoon project yeah yeah um, i imagine there are a lot of those phones kicking around in uh thrift shops and, and yeah that's exactly where yeah. i went i just went to cool. a thrift shop and grabbed the one they had and yeah. uh it's um you know because and i don't know if this would strike p 
people younger mm -hmm. than us that never had a landline phone to talk to mm -hmm. someone through, but there's an intimacy to it. Sure. It's, it's got that feeling like, you know, you're on the phone for a couple hours, like <laughs> right. spilling your guts to yeah. somebody you trust. There's old ones um, that had the like uh, plastic shoulder rest so you could uh, <laughs> could really get into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a lost art form, right? Mm -hmm. Like holding mm -hmm. the phone between your shoulders <laughs> like that. You yeah. can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought about that there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's something different about the cell phone, even still being right there in your ear. Right. It's a, yeah. Yeah different feel yeah what even do you some use? of those sounds oh dial sure. tones and uh right, busy right. signals yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> the uh the dial-up modem sound that was you know all over 90s music for a while <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> what do you wind up using the phone mic on i don't know if i've actually used it on a recording for mm -hmm. anything any songs yet um yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have, but yeah. I, I know I want to do it at some point when, mm -hmm. you know, you, some kind of like intimate part of a song where you want it to sound like, you, you know, that feeling. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember having friends, you play your guitar over the phone, I made mean, this song, <laughs> yeah. what do you think? And I, when I, next time I want to capture that. Cool. You know, you can get pretty far and pretty close with some EQing and, sure. you know, compression and stuff in the DAW, yeah. but... Called telephone EQ for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm glad I made it anyway. And and mm -hmm. if nothing else, I think I'll, for me, I'll take a little pride in like I made that microphone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the gear make you me like the song on. better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a different. It's a different relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that translates on some level, even if it's just for when I listen back and I think to myself, like, mm -hmm. yeah, that, there's something special about that. Yeah. <laughs> so you said it's like much smaller there at, yeah. at uh you, you call it csumb I yeah can, yeah cal state university monterey yeah. bay yeah it's a little shorter that way <laughs> yeah i wonder if that presents like some cool advantages to the students too because yeah i mean i went to high school in a place where i think there was a hundred kids in my class that mm -hmm. graduated yeah me too um, and now i teach at a school where there's two different high schools and I think altogether it winds up being close to 1500 kids that yeah. graduate. Yeah. So you can go through that school and never meet people in your grade. Right. Whereas at my school, yeah. you, you if you moved in in third grade, you were the new kid until we graduated. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. But everybody really kind of knew who you were. Yeah. For better or for worse. Right. Maybe it's harder to get away with things. <laughs> 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 but mm -hmm. it was also, I guess more of an understanding of who the students are and yeah. what they're going through. Definitely. Yeah, I think a lot of that holds true at CSUMB too. So the school um, is kind of mid-sized. I think we're around 7,000, 7,500 undergrads. But the music program, um, usually we run about 50 majors um, at any given mm -hmm. time. Um, and most of those folks, another thing that's a little unusual about us, most of those folks are doing tech in one way or another. So, you know, not just the requirement for the major, but they're, they're taking classes beyond that and see themselves as, you know, producers, engineers, or, you know, artists that are going to do that stuff for themselves as well. Um, and I think the size there, a couple directions, one, um, just kind of on the logistical side, you know, we've got this, this giant, well-equipped studio sitting there. Um, and you're, you're mostly just competing with your classmates for time there. Um, and not all of them are going to be at the stage in the program where they're, you know, able to book their own time, but we get them there pretty quick. Um, so that means you can be in there doing your own sessions. Usually, uh, if you really want to, you can get a couple hours a week, four hours a week, longer uh, at the right times. Um, and I think that hands-on time is a, is a really important factor for folks. Uh, just no substitute for, you know, learning it then going in and doing it and you know pushing your own limitations yeah. um so some of it's just the logistical side but then i think that social side you mentioned is super important too um folks are in class with the same people generally pretty small class sizes for the tech stuff um so they get to know each other um and some of that means uh cool collaborations come out of it we've had a bunch of neat bands that formed from folks that were in classes mm. together and just you know 
uh, I, hey, I'm going to book two hours to put my song down. Will you come engineer for me while I'm out there tracking my vocals? And, and that kind of stuff happens all the time, too. Um, and then the other side of that is just, you know, as faculty, it means... Um, I get to know the students pretty well too. You know, usually by the time they've graduated, I've had them for, um, you know, three, four semesters, sometimes more. Um, uh, and that's, uh, no substitute for that. You know, I think, yeah. um, the more, the, the better, you know, the student, the more you can give them helpful and useful instruction and advice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I had a couple in my music production club that mm -hmm. kind of, went through the years, cool. you know, coming to the club. And yeah. um, it's just really cool to see them grow and develop. And then you also start to get a sense of what they're trying to do. Yeah. So you can help them in that way. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. It's, it's so important. Peter and I were talking about this too when mm -hmm. we spoke, just about that connection, you know, even, yeah. even um, in the online program that I'm teaching with Berkeley, it's... Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of opportunity for connection, people yeah. to form relationships. And it's so important to mm -hmm. have, you know, people that are, you can talk to about this stuff and right. share Absolutely. ideas and pull you out of the uh, lows that inevitably come <laughs> along. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And you all were talking about uh, students kind of staying in touch and checking back in too. And yeah, man, that is, uh, yeah. that is satisfying when people get back in touch and they're like, you know, hey, you want to check out this cool music that I just made? Or, you know, even better when they're like, hey, I, I've got a wonderful job in the field and I just, just wanted to tell you about it. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, once in a while I get that from maybe a high school student or nice. or somebody yeah. from Berkeley. It is, that's kind of when you feel like, oh, maybe I'm doing this well. Mm -hmm. it's at least Absolutely. at least while they were the here. <laughs> I, I must have done something <laughs> yep. worthwhile. Because <laughs> it's it's a hard job to know if you're doing at all. You just kind of hope you try your best and uh, hope that it helps people out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. It can feel like a, sort of a black box. You know, you get your, your evals and that tells you something. But right, like the... The real payoff should be many years down the road, and if 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 students don't yeah. come back and tell you, then uh, you know, I guess you can always do a little little social media stalking, but uh, you know, it's better if they just uh, <laughs> right. come and give you the update. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do that in my classes at the high school. I always give them um, at the end of the year like a piece of paper and mm -hmm. it's blank and it's just anything you want to say, you know. And nice. I tell them, I'm like, look, you know, I've been observed how many times this year a couple yeah. you know right and yeah i got that right up and all but you guys really know what's going yeah. on in here you know yeah. wh what do you think i let me know because i'm trying to improve upon this thing i'm doing here so right. yeah i yeah. really do value those opinions a lot because oh absolutely yeah they went through it they yeah. <laughs> they yeah. saw the good and up uh, and all the bad days too so. yep yep yeah yep i know people have uh, a lot of justified criticisms about student evals. You know, there's all kind of research on on biases and things like that. At the same time, you know, there's always nuggets in there, right? You know, like, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, problems when you just turn them into quantifiable data and, you know, don't uh, don't take into account all those biases biases and things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I get a ton out of reading what they write in the, the actual qualitative stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I'm sure that's the same for like professional evaluations too. Sure. If they like you, <laughs> like, yep, yep. That that it's, it goes a long way, and um, <laughs> right. It's it's nice to nice to get that perspective too. Anyway. Yeah, I'm curious about the um, the combo of the, the the high school English teaching and the Berkeley teaching, and um, where where do they overlap? I, I'm I'm sure there's there's a lot of spots there, but uh, there's there's seem like two very different uh, classroom environments. Well, if you're in the Berkeley class, you signed up and paid money to be there. Yep. So you're, you're kind of excited, <laughs> I think, on some level, mm -hmm. uh, usually. In my English class, you have to be there. You don't yeah. have a choice. You have right, to right. pass four years of English to graduate high school. Yeah. So there may be a tougher sell. Sure. You know, and, that makes sense. And also... Um, it's it's not some of them like don't want to read don't want, don't want to mm -hmm. write they, they think sure. 
they don't like it. And it's yeah. probably because school has beaten it out of them their sure. whole life. Sure. And, yeah. You know, I always say to them, like, you have, it's, I don't like to read just because I like to decode words. <laughs> <laughs> I like to read things I like to read about. Mm -hmm. It's just like movies. Who, who likes movies? They all raise their hand. Mm -hmm. I could show you bad movies. I could show you bad TikTok accounts if you'd say <laughs> you hate TikTok. <laughs> sure. And I think school does that. Yeah. honestly, to yeah, yeah. to a lot of students through the actual reading they have to do. Yeah. You know, and when you're yeah. that young, like, you're not into the classics for sure. the most part. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's like an academic exercise yeah. for, even for me, I don't read Shakespeare for fun. I, I appreciate yeah. it. It's it's great work, but it's work for me mm -hmm. to, right. you know, yeah. it's not the same. So that's the main difference, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's... That makes sense. The self-motivation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's not a knock against my high school students oh, sure. in any way. I mean, yeah, yeah. I totally get it. I was the yeah. same way. I didn't even like <laughs> English in high school at all, really. Mm -hmm. But um, there are so many overlaps that it sometimes I almost don't know what I'm teaching in a way. <laughs> what, especially when you get into like the more philosophical mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. more foundational stuff about work hard yeah. work work mm. ethic creativity mm -hmm. um then it almost doesn't matter what you're talking about sure like and and there are a lot of like principles and ideas that i share with them that a few hours later i'm talking about to berkeley kids yeah or students cool. um so it's it's cool that there is that and i didn't see that right away when mm -hmm. i've first started all this stuff, teaching and then yeah. doing music. I didn't see all those connections, but the more I think I understand both, the more I see the connection. Sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. This is, is back a uh, back a couple points, but uh, I just finished reading this Nick Hornby book called, I think it's called Dickens and Prince, though it might be the other way around, which is literally a comparison between Charles Dickens and Prince. Um, oh, wow. Which I, I got to be honest, my my takeaway from it is that it is a little bit of a stretch, but it was a fun excuse for him to write about both people. Um, yeah. But it, <laughs> what you were saying reminded me of there was a second a section in there where he's talking about a judge in some criminal trial, you know, assigning this kid who was convicted of I think like some kind of violent offense, if I remember correctly, to read Dickens. Right, that was like his 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 punishment <laughs> uh -huh. was supposed to be sort of morally elevating at the same time, and uh, and Hornby had some good stuff about you know sort of how little sense that makes in so many ways, and that you know like <laughs> you know he, you know he talks about coming to love Dickens in high school or maybe it was college, but uh, also that you know like Dickens was lowbrow in his time. <laughs> You know? Yeah, yeah, right. Like, like he would be shocked that uh, that he's being held up as this uh, paragon of of classic literature. Um, and uh, yeah, right. I think that stuff is is fascinating. And yeah, it's a good reminder for music too. That's another um, like mid career thing I find myself working on is uh, it's it's so easy to go to musical examples that I assume people will know, but you know, a couple couple generations removed here. These are, it's not super familiar. And uh, mm. yeah, so maybe there's, there's a slight classics problem to overcome in, uh, in music too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, that's pretty funny about the reading. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, like the classic detention scene with the kid writing on the board, I would, mm -hmm. whatever. Yep. I make it a point, I never make writing a punishment. Yeah. I don't that want that sense. association, you know, right. or, or reading or it's yeah. because it's already got a bad rap with a lot of kids. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't like to do that, but um, that is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my wife has a great story of the opposite, which is her dad uh, growing up would tell her that she had a bedtime, uh, had to be asleep, except if she was reading. So she would mm. like, you know, uh, voraciously read because she thought she was getting away with something, uh, staying up past her bedtime and, I'm sure that yeah. was that was her dad's plan all along. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can I did the same a little bit, but I wasn't reading the books for school. Sure. You know, like to yeah, me yeah. it was like a different it, it was a lot like music too. It was like a different world. I, I mm -hmm. would listen to music, but for me in school when I was a kid, like 
all this music we were doing was like, I'm not into that at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Playing in the, I didn't play in the band. I wasn't yeah. interested in learning the stuff we were doing in our little music classes. <laughs> like, because yep. we weren't, we weren't playing music. We were just learning yeah. about it. And right, I don't know. Yeah, and when you have no choice over rep, that's tricky, right? That's yeah, you know, yeah. Back to that same that same issue. Well, it's funny what you say though about like finding those common reference points because mm -hmm. I go through that all the time where mm -hmm. there's there's things like I just think they're gonna know and they don't, and every year <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised. <laughs> right. And yeah. every year I think there's fewer common things for us all, just as a culture. Even. Sure. Yeah. You know, we used to have our few channels and our MTV, and right. you kind of knew what was going on, and yeah. everyone had a, the same reference points. But now everyone chooses their own adventure, and yeah, you, you could be watching obscure, like you know, nineteen sixties spy movies all the time. <laughs> and, you know, who knows what? Right, someone Absolutely. else is watching. Yeah, I started making it a point, like a couple years into teaching of. Uh, you're just jumping on streaming platform and just going straight over to like chart playlists and uh, and you know once every few months just going down and making sure I was listening to like the the top twenty things and uh, mm -hmm. that was super super eye opening and I think especially for teaching engineering and production um, important right like it it gave me a much better lens yeah. into uh, some of the sounds that uh, that that I think the students were aspiring to and uh, and I mean just you know got me aware of a bunch of artists that despite their massive success and popularity somehow were not on my radar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. It, it, it is a good thing to just keep an eye on. And yeah. especially I think when you're looking at the production aspect mm -hmm. of, of like, you know, hit music, it, to me, that's where it's interesting. A, a lot yeah. of the actual music isn't so much my cup of tea most mm -hmm. of the time, but the the work that goes in to get it to sound like that is yeah you know it's like some really fine skills behind that and oh, absolutely yeah people want to know how to do that kind of stuff despite my yep. tendency to want to make everything sound like it came out of a garage <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think it's yes it's super interesting that the so much of the what I think of as like production virtuosity seems to happen on really really popular music you know that, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of surprising, and maybe it's more a contemporary thing. But like the amount of uh, experimentation that happens with like with mixes on tracks that are you know from giant artists and wind up on the uh, on the top of the charts. It's uh, yeah, I appreciate it. It's uh, it's nice to feel like that stuff is is appreciated too. You know that it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that folks are into hearing cool engineering. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. It's part of what makes a lot of the artists you know, have that edge and sound so slick and fresh mm -hmm. because of the way it's presented. Yeah. And having that attitude too will help you enjoy many more kinds of music, right. even if the actual music itself isn't for you, you can yeah. appreciate some other aspect of it. Yep. That's an exercise I do with the students um, periodically, um, you know, sort of like in a music appreciation vein, but, you know, I... I I tell them, you know, you certainly don't have to like all the music you hear, right? You know, everyone's entitled to personal taste for sure. Um, but I think as a musician, it's a good exercise to try to find something to appreciate about every piece of music you hear. Because, mm. you know, I mean, what piece of music was made without somebody at some stage pouring heart and soul and sweat and tears into it? Um, and so there's got to be something there that's, you know, cool and inspirational and interesting um or at least where you can just say you know hey it's not my cup of tea but i can really tell what they were uh what they were putting into it right and different people come to music for different reasons some people want to mm -hmm. hear um just a fun beat some people yeah. want to hear something that sounds fresh and new and some people want to hear musicians playing really well some people want to hear great songs some people yeah. want a mood Right. to study to or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's to know how to access a lot of that stuff is important if you want to be a versatile producer, engineer, yeah. any of those jobs, really. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> what are the classes you're teaching? 
Yeah. Well, right now, nothing because I'm on You're sabbatical. You're on sabbatical, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, a bunch of time for creative projects, which is exciting. Um, but normally there's um, – well, actually, we're at a little bit of a transition point. We are um, – we're just about to launch next year um, kind of the return of a, a dedicated tech concentration within the major. Um, so we've always had a bunch of flexibility and a bunch of tech classes, but I got to build it out a little more formally and add a couple things. So um, we um, we have a couple sort of intro tech classes, you know, the things that get people started, getting you introduced to the DAW and um, some basics of acoustics and signal flow. Um, and then where I usually get people... We do a dedicated uh, recording tracking class um, and a dedicated mixing and editing class. Uh, and then uh, at the top of that structure, um, we do a class just called Advanced Audio Production that's kind of putting it all together. So for that one, usually uh, an outside artist or a few outside artists comes in and um, the students see a, a small project sort of start to finish with, with that artist. Nice. Um, so that's been a bunch of it. And then the stuff we're getting to bring online newly will be a uh, post-production audio course. Um, we've got a really great film department in particular at CSUMB that we've been collaborating with for a long time. So building that side out a little more, but also some relevance for you know TV and games, of course. Um, a live sound course coming on board, which has always kind of like been a part of the other ones, but um, given it its own mm -hmm. space. Um, and then a uh, MIDI synthesis and DSP course to kind of pull all of that stuff into its own place as well. Um, so, yeah, those will all be mine when I go back. And then usually I get to do um, uh, the, every student at CSUMB, regardless of program, does a capstone project, so senior thesis style, um, you know, usually a, a research paper, but in our case, usually also a creative project of some sort. Um, and I usually get to get to work on those as well, which is mm. which is always super satisfying. Nice. So you kind of help them see their project come into fruition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are uh, yeah, you know, self directed, self selected, um, and I just kind of get to step into that advisor role and uh, you know help them get what they want to do over the finish line. And uh, mm. yeah, yeah, that's always fun. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I love about all that too, and that's so built into this kind of program is that everything is real world stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like so much in you know normal school is just academic work for school. Mm -hmm. Even in my English class, there's a lot of stuff they have to do to get ready for the state exam. Sure. So they can write these two essays that they will never have to write again in their life <laughs> after they take the test. Mm -hmm. that no one ever writes <laughs> yep. and and it's this is why so many kids probably say they don't like to write or they don't sure. like to read it's yeah you kind of but it's music courses and programs like this that you get to choose what you're doing and you yeah, get absolutely. to really follow your own passions is so important because that's actually reality i think so much yeah, more than for sure yeah I think so. And I think, I, I, I hope we give people a good balance too between working on their own music, you know, or, you know, working with their colleagues on original stuff. And uh, I think that's also, it's super valuable at the end of the process, but also at the beginning, because, you know, you screw up tracking guitar for your own uh, song, then all right, you just redo it, right? You know, there's, yeah. there's no outside artist breathing over your shoulder. But um, on the flip side, I think once they get some foundational skills, um, then having that that external artist experience is is really valuable too. Um, you know, even if they don't want to go be an engineer and engineer somebody else's records, um, I think seeing it from the other perspective is uh, mm. is good too. Um, and everybody comes out of the program definitely having been you know on both sides of the glass, um, and hopefully, yeah, developing some uh, some empathy <laughs> as a result. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's important. Yeah, yeah, just an understanding of what the other people are doing. You know, that's <laughs> right. It's amazing what doing the other job will do for that. I mean, just yeah. like when I was a waiter, what that oh, sure. did for when I go to restaurants, right? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Changes your perspective completely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, again, that's still real world. You're working on somebody's project. You're, yeah. Right. 
doing Absolutely. their thing. Um, yeah, and with any luck, it turns into release, and you know, it doesn't always, but uh, but often does, which I think is super exciting too, right? You know, leaving the degree with with some credits on something out in the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it reminds me when I um, I saw Peter uh, Peter Bell, who you mentioned before, not too long ago, and uh, I was was talking with him about whether it made sense to like bring in a ringer artist who is going to be going to be what you don't want somebody to be in the studio, right? Like whether, you know, coach somebody in advance to come in and like, all right, you know, I want you to complain. Difficult. I want you to be difficult um, <laughs> just to give the students that experience. And uh, I've never done that before, but I, I started, I started wondering, you know, you don't want to make it a pain, but like maybe a pain, you know, when it's, a, there's a safety net there and, uh, and, and you've yeah. got an artist who I can just ask to turn it off might, uh, might be good too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did you determine that it's something you might do or what what did he say? <laughs> did yeah, he have any? Yeah. I think he was he was definitely, you know, sympathetic to the idea that um I mean, you're not going to make it through a career without encountering plenty of difficult people to work with, right? And mm -hmm. uh um yeah, and maybe there's some value to uh making sure people have that experience when they're in, in the, the safer confines of the classroom. But, uh, but it's tough, you know, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think any teacher enjoys putting their students in tough situations. <laughs> right. You know, like, I guess there's tough love is a thing, but it's not my particular pedagogical approach. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's for someone else that's into yeah, that yeah. a little more. <laughs> it, it's not a bad thing to be exposed to, like you said, in that mm -hmm. safe environment. Yeah. Um, because it can open your eyes a little bit to mm -hmm. like simple things that um, come off the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, even like playing live, right? Mm -hmm. um, asking the audience, how's the sound out there? Is everything okay? <laughs> Is yeah. in a way like, I don't trust the mixing engineer. I don't <laughs> trust the front of house person. And yep. I didn't know that until <laughs> I kind of was on the other end of it. Mm, and mm -hmm. like, and, and it, luckily for me, I wasn't really too serious about it. I was just sure. kind of doing it. But then I was, part of me was kind of like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> like, but, you, know, you know, that's yeah. not, for, that's not their job. What are you yep. going to listen to? Like someone yep. write, that guy doesn't like it. That one, <laughs> they like it, but. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. The guy in the third row said uh, the bass is too loud. <laughs> yeah. But the other one thinks the vocals need to come up. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Turn up the bass and turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when, as the uh, as the live sound engineer, you just you know do something with your hand behind the desk, and then and then right. they give you the thumbs up back. Oh yeah, that's much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, there was some guitar player, uh, or maybe it was a bass player. I saw a video of on Instagram or something mm -hmm. that had a knob on the bass that mm -hmm. did nothing, <laughs> and it was just mm -hmm. his knob for pleasing you know the engineer mm -hmm. or whatever can you do this and he's like oh yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> sounds good <laughs> yep. hmm. yeah those are good reminders yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that makes it into the lessons though yeah just pretend <laughs> to do what they ask you to do <laughs> you know i i talk about it occasionally with the uh, students because i also find pretty frequently with the students, right? We're doing a session with an artist, somebody's out there and they'll say, oh, hey, can I get more or, of whatever? And before I have actually gotten over to change anything, they'll be like, okay, yeah, that's great. And so yeah. then, you know, we talk about that, right? You know, right. I'm not trying to trick them, but like, you know, if they just told me they're happy, I'm not gonna tell them I didn't do anything either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, uh, There is yeah. a sort of placebo effect. Oh, right? totally, and yeah. And it might be just part of making the artist comfortable too mm -hmm. in that sure. um, they feel like they have a little control over it. And you know yeah. that if they ask you something that you will respond to yeah. them and Absolutely. help them. Yeah. I yep. guess that's probably something you get into, right? Like just making the mm -hmm. artist feel comfortable. and. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the, um, you know, the, the talk back mic, is one thing that almost nobody, no matter how experienced they are, you know, in their home studio setup, has any experience with coming in as students. Mm -hmm. um, and so that idea that, you know, 
like unless you are telling them what's going on um, they're just kind of flying blind out there, you know, like, um, right. one of our control rooms doesn't even have a, a, a window into the live room. We've got a camera so we can see out there if we need to, but, uh, but the artist is just totally dependent on what we tell them. And so, uh, you know, thinking about, um, how to communicate, um, effectively in that context and, uh, and just thinking about, you know, frequency of communication, right? Like, you know, an artist is so much less likely to get frustrated with you if you jump on or like, hey, give me a minute, I'm going to adjust levels on this and I'll be right back with you than if they're just sitting there and it's silent and mm. they don't know what they're waiting for. Um, mm. Yeah, so it's something we talk about a lot in the sessions. It's something I'm, and maybe that's the right way to do it. It's something I'm curious about, um, sort of how to, I could teach it even more outside of directly in the sessions too. Um, yeah. But it, you know, comes up very organically and also in some manufactured ways once we have have artists there yeah right mm -hmm. yeah because that is a weird feeling when you do a take mm -hmm. and then you're like you know you're like <laughs> yep. looking around your hands are up like <laughs> yeah and you don't know you don't know if like they're thinking you're terrible they're Right, you right. don't know if they're having the discussion like we need to get somebody else to do this. This is just not working. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's such a pressurized, intense environment to be recording out there at all. And uh, yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta be their friend, you know. <laughs> Even if you're, yeah. you you got to deliver some bad news or ask them to do it again, it's uh, yeah, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you have a very kind of warm, friendly disposition about oh, yourself. That, that must come across. Um, so when we were at the retreat, mm -hmm. the songwriting retreat, we yeah. had the um, the night of performances. Yeah. And you were running the sound with, you were doing mixing from the iPad yeah, and yeah. stuff, yeah. kind of moving around. Um, and you you really had that kind of like, hey, it's going to be cool. Like, just <laughs> give me a little level. Yeah, just like yeah. that. And it sounds nice. Like you would say yeah. things like that. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. Just that kind of made you feel okay. And I know for me, like, getting in on like the sound check, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going on after like, like Mira mm -hmm. voice is incredible. Right. Yep. So it's, you, Mira go to, um, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You put any kind of mic in front of her and she's going to sound great. Yep. Yeah. I think and, I told her and, she sounded great on like five different mics over that. I was like, that mic sounds really good on you. Next day, different mic. That mic sounds really good. And at some point I just got to <laughs> tell her it's her. <laughs> yeah. It's not the yeah. mic. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. But yeah, that, like that's kind of an uncomfortable, intimidating mm -hmm. moment for a lot of people. And it is for me when you're trying to figure out if anything sounds okay. And oh, yeah. um, it's it's nice to have that. I think that that etiquette is a, an important thing. And maybe people like yourself kind of have it naturally, but. Um, no, thanks. Yeah, I hope so. I think, I mean, I will say, you know, all of you were super easy and generous and uh, legitimately, you know, sounding good right out of the box. But uh, yeah, that was, it was a little bit of a tricky one too, just cause um, you know, I, I hadn't really touched that board before. Um, you know, right. uh, Matt, uh, Matt Jones, who put it all together, uh, I got to go over and kind of see how it was set up a little bit before. And um, he walked me through his understanding of it, but uh, yeah, first time running sound on it. And uh, mm. yeah, I think you're right. The, the, um, you know, if, if, if your live sound engineer is stressed as an artist, how are you not going to be stressed, right? Like, yeah. it's just, you know, you're going to worry and you're going to, you know, get responses or, uh, you know, hear things that you're going to have a natural uh, pushback against. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I hope I'm I hope I'm good at, at pulling that off consistently and uh, definitely uh, yeah. an intention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was great, and um, it really like the sound part of the show was so far in the background of anyone's mind because nice. it was running yeah. so smoothly. Yeah, that was yeah the other uh, the other piece of the puzzle too is you know you all as performers up there for for sure, but then also I've got you know a bunch of outstanding engineers sitting in the audience listening to it all too. That's uh, that's not always the case <laughs> at right, a typical right. live show. <laughs> People that might be able to hey you know the uh, Mm -hmm. 800 hertz is a little out of whack tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could imagine. I think everybody had that a little bit, you know, when you're around a group of people that mm -hmm. like that was a, was a pretty, pretty experienced bunch of people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything was covered. Um, 
You guys did great work, by the way. Your oh, group thanks. was with Miragato and mm -hmm. and Cindy Alexander, yep. Peter Bell. Yep. Um, you guys produced two songs in the week, which yeah. was pretty fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, I, uh, it even, occurs to me I got to send uh, one of them. We're still still finalizing arrangement and mix stuff, and the other one. Well, we might even retract some stuff again, but I, I got to share some uh, some mixes back out to the group um, since we were kind of writing and recording right up through uh, through Friday there. But uh, yeah, yeah, man, what a amazing group of folks to uh, to get a chance to spend uh, an intense week making music with. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah, nice collection of talents too. Um, yeah, diverse absolutely. talents and mm -hmm. different perspectives and styles too. Yeah. Um, it was a real yeah. crash course in uh, in that kind of songwriting too. I think I said something like this towards the beginning when I was introducing myself. But uh, you know, a ton of the work I do normally is collaborative. You know, with a a filmmaker or museum staff, or you know, as an engineer for an artist. Um, but usually, when I'm composing, it's pretty solitary. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 me and the computer, or an instrument, or both. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the idea of just sitting in a circle with four folks and having some songs come out of that was was not something I've done before. And it was, uh, yeah, cool to, to, to find a way into that. And, I mean, to work with three folks who were so generous about like, giving me spaces into that too and, you know, right. drawing out where there was room for contribution. And, um, yeah, yeah, super grateful to the three of them and to, uh, to Matt uh, for putting it all together too. Yeah, awesome time. I did get a little insight into your group a little bit. I, I felt yeah. really lucky because I, I had a few moments with the other two groups as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Where um, I, I was I was yanked into the other group mm -hmm. by Renato <laughs> vocals, to do background right? vocals. Yeah, yeah. I thought I remembered that. And he had the headphones on my head <laughs> and <laughs> lyric sheets in front of me. He's like, sing. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't even know this song. I've never heard it before. Like, He's like, this doesn't matter. Just sing. And it was... Because of that, it was just so fun and mm -hmm. welcoming. And I mean, their song was incredible. Oh, yeah. And um, the pressure of having to sing for people I've never sung before. And now yeah, they like, will yeah. listen to me like in headphones and really close. Right. right. And I'm going to be singing in a room where it's quiet. Yeah. Uh, all that melted away because nice. of course it's going to be a little rough around the sure. edges. Like, if, yeah. you know, I'm, I don't even know what the song sounds like. So, yeah. But that was so fun. And then I think it might have been the last day. Um, yeah, you did a little writing Peter with, uh, and Cindy with Cindy and Peter. Were yeah. in there. And then yeah. you, you dropped in the room too. And yeah. we were just kind of, you know, mostly fly on the wall. But it was yeah. fun to offer a few thoughts and um, absolutely just see how you guys worked a little bit. And mm -hmm. it was a totally different feel and yeah. um, really cool. Really, like, it's. It's a scary thing on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. um, just intimidating, especially, yeah, and just, you know, you're writing, you're vulnerable and yeah. all of that. And um, But it didn't feel that way at all, which was so amazing. <laughs> I think that definitely has a lot to do with Matt who put yeah. it together and went yep. through a lot of lengths to get us comfortable and yeah. without doing anything too cheesy like uh yeah, <laughs> get some very, meeting uh, where you're yeah, getting to know yeah. activity trust falls or anything <laughs> you know he, he he really like hit that nicely mm -hmm. with um the right balance of activities and conversations to just warm Absolutely. us up and yeah and yeah just a super comfortable spot to be to and you know well set up like i also appreciated that it never really felt like people were competing for studio time you know it was, yeah there was enough enough to go around and uh, it felt like everyone could kind of work very fluidly and yeah All i right. did so after the first day i came home and i was like man i don't know that these people need me for anything <laughs> it was like these are incredibly talented experienced folks and uh uh and I, I really appreciated, you know, like I was saying, the more the week went on, they, um, they're, they're also just, yeah, so good at like making space for it. And then, you know, we got to time to record stuff and I was like, oh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm an engineer. <laughs> that, yeah. That is, that That's is true. also a reason I'm here. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's cool how it was set up so that there were different kind of, um, specialties, I guess, mm -hmm. with people. Yeah. Right. So, so when that time came, like that's when you step up and then, you yeah. know, and we, we had that too. And mm -hmm. 
And yeah, everyone was very open to that, letting people be part of it, which totally. was cool. Yeah. Um, it was interesting hearing about uh, your group sitting on three different laptops, uh, all working on the same song too. It's like, ah, oh, that is such a different experience than the way that my group's yeah. working. It's really, you know, even within the confines of this thing, there's so many ways of going about it uh, and, right. and getting to cool results. Yeah. Yeah, our group started out. I think we went in the studio just for the space and we we're mm -hmm. playing guitars and talking. We spent a lot of time talking first, which was yeah. cool, getting to know each other a little. Um, I, you know, I didn't know anybody really. I knew Matt, but mm -hmm. only on the internet and he was sure. on the podcast once. So right, right. I never met him before in person and um, I was working with Chloe as well. Chloe Echo mm -hmm. is her artist's name. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we just kind of chatted, talked, and we, oh yeah, we found like commonalities in music we liked. And mm -hmm. through the conversations, we started like, once in a while a line would pop out and we started playing around some chords. Nice. But yeah, what we wound up doing at one point was going to the Matt's beach house mm -hmm. right on the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, right down the street where Peter me. and I stayed, which is <laughs> wild. That's right down the street from you. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not nearly as close to the beach as uh, as as Matt's place over there, but uh, but yeah, it's like a 20 minute walk or so. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we were just in there with our laptops. I was working on the drums, I think, and mm -hmm. yeah, Matt was maybe playing with some of the vocals that were there, and Chloe maybe with the, some synths. I forget exactly what everyone was doing. I think it switched a bit, but yeah. It was fun to be sitting there and like kind of looking around knowing this thing is like growing. <laughs> yeah. We're all doing our separate thing and it would eventually have to be recombined. But it was, uh, and that was kind of the thing about the whole week was that there's just so many creative people around working, yeah. doing right, stuff. Right. So you took your break, you got something to eat and then yeah. next thing you know, you're seeing something going over here at the piano or you mm -hmm. go upstairs and there's another thing happening. Yeah. Derek was outside and <laughs> right, you know, right. doing yep, all this on the lawn. It's, uh, it's nice. <laughs> um, that's powerful, you know. I, yeah. Even when I'm I'm home, I'm in mm -hmm. my house. This is my mm -hmm. basement, if you can't tell. And uh, <laughs> this is where I do all my work. And yeah. there are days like if if my wife is busy working mm -hmm. and she doesn't do music, but whatever she's working on, yeah. you know, that's her. She teaches as well. She runs, mm -hmm. got a gaming store and. Um, mm -hmm that energy seeps into me and I, I get oh, sure. more productive too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm not going to sit on the couch and watch TV <laughs> if, if she's busy. Right. I, like, yeah. I don't know if I feel guilty or <laughs> what it is, but it, it motivates me. Sure, absolutely. It's so good to put yourself around that. Yeah, yep. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I totally feel that too. At the same time, I so the, the space I'm in here, my home studio, um, I wind up doing a lot of late night work um, I think for me too, there's uh, there's something about just the the quiet house, the quiet neighborhood, um, that uh, that that energy is is conducive to sort of uh, mm. yeah maybe like the other side of that is just like you know feeling totally alone so that all the all the bad ideas can uh, <laughs> can yeah. make yeah. their way out in safety <laughs> and then uh, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I I love those late night hours but I just don't. I think I'm too conditioned getting up early for I, I imagine my, the, uh, high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One one perk of the college teaching gig is I'm I'm rarely in the yeah. classroom before ten. <laughs> but it, it translates a lot for me into the mornings. Sure. So on Absolutely. the weekends, I'm usually yeah. up with a couple hours to spare before anything starts happening around here. So nice. I can. Yeah, I'm like you. I like to get those. Uh, <laughs> those bad takes and bad <laughs> ideas out mm -hmm. in solitude. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, I'm going to try to hit that note I have never hit before. Uh, I'm going to do it with nobody yeah. else around. <laughs> yeah, so th those are the days that I wait until she goes to work. <laughs> <laughs> Shut all the windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny though to be around a group of people where you kind of don't have that luxury too and sure absolutely. and it's okay and for it to be okay is great um, yeah yeah that was remarkable to me how quickly it felt uh felt quickly to like or felt comfortable to you know throw out a line for a lyric and you know i i mean i write lyrics for my own stuff on occasion but it's not something i think about as my 
forte really. And, uh, mm. you know, and definitely not something I've done a lot of collaboration on. And, uh, you know, so in a, in a room with, uh, with a bunch of other folks that do that really expertly, them, uh, them having the, the graciousness to, to let me stick an idea in there was, uh, was really nice. And, uh, yeah. And remarkable that just within, you know, within a day it felt like, uh, that space was there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's nice to have that. And you, you have to get into like this state of just being really open to everything. Mm -hmm. Um, accepting ideas and seeing what you can do with it. Yeah. I love the stand up comedy, um, not stand up, uh, improv comedy kind of, uh, approach of yes and mm -hmm. so absolutely when when you say we're doing improv and you're like oh my god there's an elephant chasing me on a bicycle i have to be like <laughs> oh my god and he's got a gang of tigers with him like, <laughs> it's always yes and something mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. it's such a great way to write because yeah. nice it idea. just lets yeah. ideas in and you can you know, we might well in the editing phase take the tigers out or something sure. but sure, sure. um to just kind of roll with things because it also gets you making decisions and right yeah yeah and you, yeah you get the uh the scaffolding to hang the stuff on and maybe the stuff you're hanging on changes down the road but super yeah. valuable to have the uh the scaffold there yeah 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 the the just picking something and going with it is so important mm -hmm. i definitely <laughs> waste too much time too often in those early stages trying to decide if something that that would work perfectly fine yeah. is smart enough good enough right. intelligent enough there's this yep. a clever chord change and yep yep yeah I yeah just that's all right out the um the the sort of composition background for me doing um doing composition uh in in undergrad and for grad school i think some of the uh the sort of like contemporary new music you know experimental classical approach it kind of feels like you are starting from scratch every time you write anything, right? Like the, like the musical language needs to be invented along with the piece. Um, and that produces amazing stuff. And there's some, some, some things I love about it, but, uh, coming out of that, I also had to like find a way to give myself permission to just, uh, just write from the, oh, I like how that sounds approach, you know? <laughs> doesn't doesn't matter if it's the same chord progression I've heard a dozen other times. If uh, if I've got something to do with it, that's great too. And you know, next time I'll I'll go back and you know figure out how to do a piece entirely with XLR cables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of that stuff. I heard some of it on your SoundCloud, I think. Oh yeah. Um, I forget. What so that. some of it, <laughs> it sounds like you're completely rethinking like concept of instruments even just sure. what they do and how they're performed on and yeah and you just said something i want to go back to real quick you said with only xlr cables <laughs> <laughs> i mind, haven't uh, done that piece yet but you know someone will i mean there is um the thing that it brings to mind there's a um a steve reich piece uh sonic youth did it on that that um like 20th century music album they did um, I, I think I've heard you mention Sonic Youth before, so maybe it's familiar from that. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 my, I'm going to get my my music composition PhD card taken away. I can't remember the name of the piece right now, but it is um, microphones suspended over speakers, and then you set them in motion. I think it's called pendulum music. Um, mm. So they swing back and forth, and they feedback, of course, right? Because they're pointing directly at. But the feedback changes as they swing, and then they, you know, like the rhythms change, and. Uh, so maybe maybe that's the closest I can come up with for somebody who's actually done the uh, the XLR piece, but uh, uh -huh. I don't know. And when I come that's up cool. with it, I'll let you know. <laughs> I had uh, Sarah Bell Reed on the show. Mm -hmm. um, if you're familiar with her, she's like a, so. she plays the trumpet mm -hmm. in the, like a classical sense too, mm -hmm. but um, also very experimental, running it through modular synthesizers. Mm -hmm. So her, nice. her big thing, like it seems like that she's focused on lately is the modular sense and experimental cool. sound design. Yeah. And she was talking about no input mixing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Where you run the outputs of the mixer back into the input. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no sound coming into it. Yeah. But you start turning knobs and get weird feedbacks and all the yeah. stuff you're not supposed to do, basically. Yeah, yeah. And amazing the range of sounds way. that come out of that approach. 
you know it's uh yeah you, you'd think it might be sort of like a a one trick instrument but uh man i've heard uh, a, a beautiful range of stuff that folks have gotten out of no input mixer pieces yeah yeah i haven't done that yet um yeah. mostly because i'm too lazy to <laughs> <laughs> disconnect all my mics and everything sure sure yeah um <laughs> it does take a lot of cables <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I might want to, well, my dog is kind of deaf, so she probably won't care, but <laughs> those will be the frequencies she can hear probably, uh, but I'll have to wait till no one's home. <laughs> I was making a, a sample pack of guitar mm. feedback oh, nice. a little while yeah. back. Mm -hmm. You know, I was recording my band's album and I wanted to get feedback parts yeah. to swell in and out. So I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to run it the whole track and, bring, and just play with it and see what I get. And I did that for all the songs. Yeah. So you're talking like, I don't know, a good hour, two, oh, probably, cool. probably more like two really of just making incredibly obnoxious feedback. Noise. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking like, this will be good because then I won't have to ever do this again. <laughs> you know? And I can have them without making all the noise. Yep, yep. It was the one time ever that my wife came down and was like, what are you doing? <laughs> fair, <laughs> so, very I mean, she's fair. Had yeah. me, she's listened to me looping things for right, hours right. while I tweak like one yeah. little effect or something and <laughs> just all kinds of stupid sounds coming out of here. But that was the thing where she came and she's like, are you okay? Like, what's going on with you? <laughs> she thought you just collapsed with a guitar in hand and it was just a... <laughs> right, like, why are you doing this? <laughs> It's good yeah, to know where those boundaries cool. are, though, too. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, it's, yep. it's for the album. And she's like, <laughs> why would anyone want to hear that? <laughs> well, maybe right. maybe don't it... take her to the uh, Steve Reich Pendulum Music concert. At, uh... <laughs> yeah. I, well, I guess, like, you know, in the, it's probably the early 2000s, um, some of my friends were going to music school and they'd mm -hmm. inevitably have these concerts of experimental music. We yeah. were going into Brooklyn to see them. Right, right. And there were some times where I, like it was just the, beyond my understanding where sure. I, I was there and I'm kind of like, uh, like why are we all standing here listening to this noise just yep. going on and on and on? <laughs> and, and there's definitely, I guess, some of it's better than others. And yeah, sometimes course, I think yeah. it's just, I don't know what's the word, but it's kind of indulgent or something. Yeah, I think there's some pieces that are, you know, like asking you to bring a, you know, a familiarity with the with the tropes, with the background, right, where they're building on something. But um, there are definitely pieces too where, yeah, I, I think there's just not a not a way in for me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it tests you a little sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, maybe but, sometimes that's the, that's the point. Um, yeah. I, um, I did my dissertation on audience interactive music in the concert hall, so pieces where you know, somehow the audience is part of the performance. Um, mm. And there's definitely a few of those that are sometimes a little like intentionally confrontational. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think there's some, some value comedy. to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of my favorite versions of it, um, do you know Fluxus, the like 50s, 60s no. avant-garde movement? They did a lot of um, uh, stuff that probably fits most comfortably in performance art, but they talked about what they did um, as event scores. And a lot of it does involve sound and some, sometimes it's really explicitly musical. Um, but th there's a Fluxus piece um, that involves like setting up a platform in the middle of the performance space, putting somebody up there holding a hose. And the performer does nothing until someone complains and then the hose gets turned on. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I really like that, right? Like it's, uh, That's funny. it's telling you something this? about, yeah. <laughs> Where does the hose get pointed? I think at the audience. I think that's oh the, the, the general, yeah. <laughs> Wow. And, like I don't know how much if ever it got performed. Some of the Fluxus stuff is definitely like conceptual in a way that, you know, like yeah. it's a piece on the page, but maybe not in performance. But um mm. yeah, there's some 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 you know, both some humor, but also like it, it says something about uh like audience performer divide and power dynamics and stuff that I think yeah. I think can be interesting too, you know, even if I don't want to be the one getting soaked. <laughs> right. There's some sadistic <laughs> tendencies behind some of that. <laughs> Yep, there's probably some of that in there too. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I didn't tend to want to push the audience too much in my own versions of that, but I did do a piece once that um, had a sensor for when people walked into the venue. So it's kind of like a pre-concert experience. You know, you'd come in to get your seat and you'd step on the sensor on the way in. Um, and it would trigger... Um, Almost all the time, it would trigger some applause. I had a bunch of different like versions of applause and cheering. So like, <laughs> almost everybody walked in and like you know everyone cheered for them. I thought you know yeah, that's a that's little. Cool. I'm curious about the surprise element. Curious about how people reacted to it. But I did build in like a five percent chance or something that you would get booed, and uh, <laughs> it happened a couple times. And I, I I have to admit I did kind of enjoy the reactions. So that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, it was something ahead. satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> yeah it's cool to push the boundaries of what performance is what music is what is yeah. tolerable and i don't always want to be the subject of sure. that experiment yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it it's fun to i really love and you do this in some of your music too like you bring in um like in some of the stuff I saw like on YouTube and on SoundCloud um, that you like to bring in some natural ambiences into your music yeah, um, to set the scene a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting when that stuff becomes musical. And yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's just the way you frame it, the noise suddenly becomes something really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think um, for me in particular too, I started doing a lot more of that um, when I was working with uh, doing post-production audio stuff for film projects. Um, and a lot of my collaborators, um, uh, often I'm doing score for them, but then I'm also doing sound design and mixing the whole thing. Or in some cases, I'm just doing sound design and, and mixing it for them. Um, and it did a little more, made me think a little more about those types of sounds, the sort of Foley and sound design aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And um, and also I started, you know, I'm, I'm still working in Pro Tools when I'm doing the post-production audio. It's the same software, the same tools. And uh, so it was, yeah, opened my my ears a little more to, uh, to building those sounds into stuff that's explicitly musical because, um, you know, what it can do for a film really jumps out and then you know why yeah. not leverage some of that and uh and like you said too i think there's some coincidences that um that work or or yeah just ways in which the sound becomes contextualized is musical um i was right. uh i just finished mixing a project by a, a guitarist named giacomo fiore um and uh he had a residency at the lou harrison house which is up in joshua tree in the park mm. uh, and Lou Harrison, a uh, famous 20th century composer. Um, and uh, so Giacomo did a bunch of improvised stuff in the park and in the house. Um, and, uh, you know, most of it recorded sort of at least the park stuff, you know, out in the natural environment. So you got all kinds of other sounds that, that come into play um, and the ways that that, you know, added to the, the guitar aspect and he also did some running the guitar through some modular synth stuff too so a little connection there um hmm. but uh yeah the you know the the birds just start feeling like you know part of the orchestration right it's yeah. uh you know you, you can tell what they are they're not disguised or anything we're not processing the birds well in one case he did have a mic inside his resonator guitar that he did some field recording with and that that's yeah, a little little acoustic processing uh -huh. but um yeah, yeah, I think those possibilities are are really cool. They, um, you know, complexity, scene setting, like you said, that they can kind of add in and in in what I hope are you know kind of unobtrusive ways too, right? Hmm. Yeah, I always like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like things to sound like they happened somewhere, and right? You can really play around with that with even just really subtle, like you almost don't even hear it. You yeah. just kind of put it in the background softly where maybe if someone gets their headphones on, they'll be like, oh yeah, listen to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the first time I ever really noticed it, I think was on the Beatles Abbey Road record when um, mm -hmm. I think it's um, Sun King comes on. Mm. Um, there's crickets in the background. Oh, right. <laughs> um, they, that little like guitar, dun, 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 dun. Do, do, do. maybe it's bass or something but it's like i was like 
Yeah, that's really cool. And I used to get I, the other place I, when I lived in my parents' place was also in the basement. So there's mm-hmm. always all kinds of crickets and insects. Yeah, yeah. Unfinished yeah. basement. And um, they would always make their way on my recordings. And yeah. I used to, at first, be like, I got to wait for that cricket to stop. But then after a while, it's kind of like, he's in the band. You yeah, know? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let him be part of it. Like, yeah. What the heck, you know? And those aspects of recordings for me bring bring me back to those times and i think yeah when i hear music like that it it brings me into a world and um yeah it's something i'm always trying to think about with recording into the computer cuz mm, it's mm-hmm. sterile it's yeah. there's yeah. nothing <laughs> there there's negative infinity db of sound <laughs> It's just so unnatural. So yeah. sometimes you record something or play something and it, it just doesn't sound like it's anywhere. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Letting that stuff in, suddenly like now we're someplace. We're in right. a world of an environment to exist in. Yeah, that's another like early, you know, post-production audio lesson was just sort of thinking about room tone, right? That, um, mm. you know, you, uh, well, hopefully, if you're working with something that was shot live and they've got uh, got mics on set that they're using, they've recorded some room tone for you. But um, like, how much a, how much of a difference that makes, and how much we can really perceive it, even if we don't hear it, if the room tone you know is not there. Like, if you did some some dialogue recording after the fact, some dubbing, or you yeah. know, if there's a an edit and you don't pencil in the room tone there to kind of fill that gap. And uh, yeah, that definitely you know. Before I started thinking about and doing some post production audio stuff, um, I don't I don't think I had an awareness of that the same way and the ways that yeah there's like very subtle sonic markers really put us in a place and like you were saying sound unnatural if they're not there. You know? Right. Yeah. Sometimes in movies that's enough to pull you out. Totally. If yeah. um, you know, out of that like kind of hypnotic, lost in the world of the movie feeling, mm-hmm. if um the dialogue is overdubbed in a weird way where it's, mm-hmm. it's just too close mic for yep. this this room or this world we're in. Like, Absolutely. We're, they're so far away, but it sounds like they're right in our... Yep, yep. Yeah, you can hear the reverb suddenly change. They didn't quite match the, uh, the location stuff. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. a tricky world. It's a... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. I I mean, geez, I, I, I don't know if that's the kind of work that... I would enjoy or it would just make me crazy because <laughs> mm-hmm. I've, I've on a couple occasions, like maybe like two or three had to fix things on the podcast mm-hmm. or sometimes something weird happens. So I'm sort of like acting my part out again, uh, you know, yeah. overdubbing tricky, it. Tricky. Yeah. And it's so hard to get it. And <laughs> I'm sitting in the same spot with the yeah. same mic and everything is the same. Yep. Who, who knows? Maybe I turned the knob on the game <laughs> or something, but yeah. It's so hard to get that right. Yeah. You got to get your energy level right. The yeah. Kind of atmosphere of the room. It's, I think yeah. that it's its could skill. be something that makes me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> I think it's definitely its own skill for, you know, for voice actors and just actors in general. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a tough one. Yeah. I, a lot of the sound design stuff I've done uh, most recently has been for animation. Um, cool. And that one sort of has the opposite problem where, um, you know, like there's, there's no inherent sound, right? There's just everything has to be put there. You know, there's no, yeah, yeah. There's no model to base it off of. Um, but that's also really fun when you, I, I think, when you get to just build it from nothing to yeah. what hopefully feels like a, you know, convincingly or appropriately realistic world. You know, it's animation, so... You put it as far as it needs to be towards realism or past, I guess. But yeah, right. Yeah, I never thought about that. You don't even have, at least in a film, you've it was filmed in a park, and there's probably some boom mics picking things up. Yeah, yeah. You'd have even if you didn't use any of that, it's there as a reference. You know. Yeah. Yeah. At least give you a sense of what you're going for. Yeah. But you yep. get to really build that out. Yeah. Yeah. That's and especially cool. in, yeah, in some more experimental animation. Um, like there's there's one I'll be working on this week. Um, 
Uh, Lindsey Stone, who's a great artist, did a, a song instrumental called November that I did some arrangement on. Uh, and, and her album's been out for a while, but uh, another frequent collaborator is just finishing up a music video for her that's all animated. Um, and I've got some sound design to do for just kind of like a frame story and then the song starts and everything goes. But um, he's got this really cool animated character and at the start of the film, um, you see the body, and there's what looks basically like an XLR jack for the neck. And then he picks up his head, which is in this kind of like glass fishbowl thing, and snaps it on. Um, and we just had like a you know good five minute conversation yesterday about what does that actually sound like, right? Is it yeah, like right. is it more metallic? Should it sound like a cable clicking in? Is it more like a thunk of you know? Yeah. And like how much is the glass the sound and? Uh, yeah, I, I think that stuff is a lot of fun too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that sounds fun because yeah. you're building it, right? Yeah. Whereas the other stuff sounds more <laughs> right. like. Yeah. When you're know, fixing so that's it. something I, I'd be happy to let AI <laughs> figure out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but the other stuff is way more creative. Like, yeah, like, sure. do we get like a bowl and like mm -hmm. get some kind of reverberation going through it or something? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty neat. You've got a track coming out. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, and very when you told me what it was, <laughs> I was shocked when I heard what it actually was because uh, <laughs> yes. it's so different. It's you could have easily just not even told me that it was a cover, <laughs> and I would have probably not realized it's, it's that far. So you want to tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's a cover of um, Waiting for the Bus, which is a ZZ Top song from... Uh, I love ZZ Top, by the way. Yeah. That's yeah, so me too. That's actually kind of how it... piece rock band. And yeah. That's kind of how it came about. I was talking to some friends just about stuff that kind of like you're always happy to listen to, you know, like yeah. regardless of the mood, the day, if you know, you put that on, it'll work fine. Um, and I, I remember in your uh, conversation with, with Peter, with Peter Bell, he was saying, talking about how he's always listened to Ray Charles, you know, like childhood yeah. through adulthood. And Ray Charles is one of those for me, for sure. But ZZ Top is another one. I think uh, especially that early stuff that, you know, like I've, I've always got time for, uh, for that. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, this one, I, I had that conversation with them, then put some on in the car on the way home. And um, it's got, you know, like a super simple but super characteristic guitar riff. And um, I think the vocals are kind of interesting. And there's, you know, there's a story in there about this guy, like, trying to get home after a long day of work. And, like, these cool details about, like, you know, brown paper bag and my take-home pay, you know? Like, he's yeah. in the liquor store and, you know, just got paid. But, like, and I was like, all right, I think there's a, um, you know, there's a version of this that... uh that's going to be different than the, like the ripping, you know, awesome rock version that, uh, that they did. And, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I turned it into something pretty, pretty ambient. I think it's probably, I'm, I'm always bad yeah. at the genre descriptions for my own stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, had to, had to still put a, a big guitar solo in the middle cause that wouldn't be fair to do his easy top song <laughs> without that. But, um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, um, something that, it feels like it's kind of reimagined from the ground up, but, uh, you know, uh, same melody, same riff, same lyrics. Uh, mm. Yeah, one thing I do with my students sometimes is use covers to talk about the um, the concept of the work, right? Like, what is the song? What's the identity of it? Mm. Um, and I, I think it's still the same song. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's interesting. So you, it's almost like the soul of the song and... Maybe the three-piece ripping guitar band is like the clothes it's wearing. Yeah, yeah. There's um, okay. there's a book called The Poetics of Rock by Albin Zach, and he has this nice divide between song arrangement and track. Um, and his definitions of them are, are like kind of direct. Like he talks about the song as basically like what you'd put on the lead sheet, you know. So chords, melody, lyrics, um, mm. and then you know arrangement comes on top of that instrumental stuff. And then by the time you get to the track, it is the recording decisions, the mixing decisions, the stuff that has to follow the material. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I I think this is still, you know, yeah, still the same song. But other than that, I think it's uh, mm. hopefully feels like its own thing. What's that called? Poetics of Rock? Yep. Poetics of, Poetics yeah. of Rock. Okay, yeah. cool. That, I got to check that out. It yeah, it's like a, a nice lot one. Of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's 
some music sometimes I think about and it's almost like you need to have the people that made it mm -hmm. in order for the song to come through. I think about sure. that a lot with like Nirvana, like mm -hmm. a lot of Nirvana songs, like they're great songs and they're not, I mean, compositionally, melodically, yeah. but it, they're like impossible to cover. <laughs> <laughs> I, as soon as you yeah. said it, I was trying to think of cool Nirvana covers and uh, yeah, it's not as many that come to mind as I might think. I'm a big fan of covers in general and uh, there's like that polyphonic spree lithium I think is pretty cool. Um, uh -huh. I don't know that one. Yeah, that, that one's oh. interesting. I think it holds up. Um, but yeah, that's the only one. There there must be some others that some other folks that pull it off. But uh, yeah, I, the I hear what you songs mean. that are like the most quintessential Nirvana. Um, like like I don't know that you can really get to without being mm -hmm. Nirvana. <laughs> there, there's yeah. certain artists like that that are just so hard to pin. And then there are other artists whose songs like anyone can sing them and they just come out great. It's, yeah, it's interesting like that. Yeah, and um. I don't think one's better than the other, but it's there. That, that's why I'm interested in this book because oh, yeah. um, that that's an interesting concept mm -hmm. of uh, there's kind of this thing of the song, and then there's this layer that goes on top of it. Yeah, and I think maybe that's a good point with some of the Nirvana stuff, where you know, like if you think about some of those songs in lead sheet format. It, it would really feel like you were missing something, right? There's yeah. like vocal timbre and performance stuff that would be hard to notate out. And, um, you know, I mean, even, you know, the some stuff about the drums, like, you know, even if you had the drums written out, I mean, you know, Zach would probably put that in the arrangement uh, category, but like, you know, like it's it's hard to imagine uh, it Smells Like Teen Spirit without that, that drum uh, start, yeah. right? Like... Right, you know, and yeah, and is it the same song the, without it? It's yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I have um, the guitar tab books for Nevermind and oh, In yeah. Utero, mm -hmm. so I, I learned guitar on those basically. Sure. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, same guitar worlds, and uh, yeah, know, mostly from the magazines, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like Hal Leonard guitar tab, <laughs> and and sometimes it's just the explanation of what's happening for like feedback sounds and all this like noise in the middle yeah. of these interludes that they do. And it's, you just can't write it down. Yeah. You know? And I think that's probably true for a lot of music nowadays though, with, mm -hmm. where sound design is such a heavy part of yeah. what's going on. Yeah. You know, how do you transcribe like, I don't know, like, um, I'm on Tobin. Mm -hmm. Is that how you say it? Um, I think so. Yeah. Or, or just like, you know, some of this stuff, like Aphex Twin. Like, what? Sure. How does that get written down? And you know, there is, um, there's a really cool record by uh, Alarm Will Sound, um, who's an experimental ensemble. Uh, they did a whole record of uh, transcribed Aphex Twin stuff that they then perform. Um, I'm okay. just pulling it up here. I think it's called, I think it's called Acoustica. Does that look right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing to hear cause it's, you know, it's people performing all that stuff, right? There's crazy rhythms and things like that. Um, I think it is a super, uh, super difficult question to answer whether they are still the same pieces, you know, hmm. right? Like they're. I mean, they're they're done that way on the album, and they are like pretty faithful transcriptions. But um, yeah, you know, when like that's a wood block instead of you know whatever <laughs> Aphex Twin cooked up in in Max or whatever Something he's using, twisted and ripped apart sound yeah. file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's always interesting with the students to see where they're willing to draw the line. They, um, I'd say, they more default to saying it's the same song though on most covers. It's hard for me mm. to get covers where um, where where they're too often willing to say, yeah, I don't know if that's the same song anymore. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder, because you can't really copyright sounds, right? Like, um, yeah, I don't like, think so. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I think there's I mean, some trademarks possible, parts, but, but yeah. Um, but yeah, not timbres really. Yeah. Yeah. Like the sound of an instrument. So like a synthesizer yeah. patch or a, right. 
or some weird sound you made by processing something over and over again. Yeah. And sometimes that's the defining characteristic. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I got to check that out. <laughs> um, so you, th I think you said uh, that possibly the 23rd of October, the track will come out. And yeah, we can that's the plan. Just if that changes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully on, uh, on, on any streaming service you're looking for, uh, just under my name, Linear Salmons. Um, and a couple other things there. This, this whole putting stuff out uh, under my own name thing is relatively new for me, but I'm uh, yeah. hoping to do more of it, part of, the, part of the sabbatical activities. Yeah, so is that the plan? For the sabbatical how Almost long are you things. um off yeah. for uh, i've got the whole uh, academic year so uh okay. yeah not back into the classroom until the fall uh of uh 24 so it's a nice nice chunk of time um so yeah i'm i'm aspiring to you know an album's worth of stuff whether or not that is uh all you know released as an album or just kind of you know yeah. trickled out as it's ready um and then a few other things i've got um an installation project with an animation colleague who uh, is doing really cool stuff based on natural landscape around here. Um, and for that one, I'm trying to do uh, generative music. So um, some software in Max that will analyze the video and create music based on what's happening uh, oh, cool. in the video. A um, couple mixing projects that, uh, yeah, that Joshua Tree thing by Giacomo Fiore that I just finished up and um, a colleague that has a really cool uh, Cora guitar and sax trio, um, Althea Sully mm. Cole, we're working on that one right now. Um, yeah, some other scoring stuff. It's, yeah, I, I loaded myself up a little bit here. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully not too much. <laughs> well, how are you going to discipline yourself? Um, yeah. You know, the, I'm curious. The retreat was really good for that, I think. Okay, so this is kind know? of a good jump start to that. Yeah, that was the first week of the semester. So it was, you know, right when all my mm. colleagues were going back to class. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously everybody there is kind of like, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day working on music. And I was taking stuff home and working on it more <laughs> after I went yeah. back. Um, so, uh, yeah, trying to, you know, just sort of... Um, get on a, a regular schedule. So I'm, I'm getting up, I've got, you know, whatever I'm working on, this is dedicated uh, time for it in the morning, you know, lunch and exercise and then back to it. And, uh, you know, trying to just, I, it, it's the, uh, doesn't sound very rock star, but the, uh, the, the nine to five version. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I, I go through this every year. Summer yeah. vacation comes around right, for school, right? right? Yeah. And I, I get, probably do like two albums, you know, this summer. Yeah, and right. I can <laughs> work on all these things and I got yep. all, all these ideas. And for those first couple of weeks, I just feel like I have endless time. Yeah. It, yeah. And so I, eh, later, you know. Yeah. Well, and the um, rest is important, right? You gotta, you gotta recharge. Well, that's what I tell myself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, like half the summer has gone by and right. you're like, oh my yep. God, I didn't do anything yet. Yeah. So it's, I find it really important to establish something. And usually for me, it's the mornings too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think about like, what do I need to get done today to feel mm -hmm. like I was productive? Yep. And yep. do that I first. Do, yeah. <laughs> I do the little, the weekly to-do list, right? Here's what I want to get to on what days. And mm -hmm. I mean, inevitably stuff moves around, but it's still, uh, yeah. yeah, it's good to have the, uh, the tangible sense of progress and the plan. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because the worst, I guess, is to like sit around thinking, "What should I do now?" I <laughs> yep, work? yep. Because yeah. I get stuck in that too often. That I, yeah, need... yeah. <laughs> and yeah, if there's you know if there's a dozen things on the list and I haven't organized them some way, there's decision paralysis is uh is a real yeah. thing for sure. Yeah, I'd hate yeah. to know how many hours I've spent over say the last summer kind of standing around <laughs> looking out the window mm -hmm. and be like maybe I could do that or you know <laughs> I think I'd like to or maybe today's a good day for the beach it's really nice out <laughs> right, right. Yep. so it it's, it would be so embarrassing I'm sure to hear that <laughs> number of hours I mean that said from uh, from the outside I, my impression is that you, you get a lot done <laughs> <laughs> so you know like the the oh. amount of music you're putting out the podcast and and you're doing all of it with uh with a, a day job that's not 
uh, super directly tied into it too. I I think that's some impressive productivity. I gotta say. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm trying, but yeah, I I you know you always see the the holes in your game. I know I sure, could probably sure, do sure. more, but um, <laughs> it's it, you know I'm not beating myself up about it, but yeah. Yeah. There's the part of me <laughs> that, so that's why I ask you, like, so yep. what are, what are you going to do? Because uh, maybe yeah. I can steal a few secrets from you. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I was like, there's no secret. It's just yeah, get to it, yep. plan it out. Yeah, and get to yeah. It. I don't think I have any secret for it. And same as you, always struggled with those summers when they roll around. That uh, yeah, I bite <laughs> off more than I can chew in my planning. And you know, if I get to half of it, I uh, I, I feel like I've 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 actually done okay. But uh. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, yeah. I mean, routine is the best thing I've, I've tried to figure out for it. I mean, I guess that and um, people giving me deadlines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything I'm collaborating help. on, even if they're like, oh, you know, whenever. I'm like, when would you like to have it? Let's, uh, let's put a date on it. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me whenever. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of whenever projects that are still sitting around <laughs> for yeah, yeah, quite yeah. a while. Yeah, that's good to have that. Even like with our band, um, we mm -hmm. always get together. Usually it's Thursdays. and Nice. So if nothing else, you chip away for that amount of time yeah. every week. And yeah, it's pretty cool to see what happens over that time where it doesn't seem like a lot, mm -hmm. but it all adds up. It's yeah. Every, every little drop in the bucket counts. Yeah. I mean, a couple hours a week over uh, over a year, that... That adds yeah. up, right? That's, yeah. Yeah, things get done. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And I think I told you uh, separately, but uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that episode with the band talking through the record and, and just yeah, really enjoyed did. hearing Thanks. the record too. That's, uh, yeah, that's so cool. That, yeah. that was a fun episode to do. It's, I think that's the only one I've ever done with other people in real in life. Room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um. <laughs> I really was thinking too while we were away, it would have been awesome. You know, we were very busy, and it, it, as much as it sounds like a lot to have a week, it's also not a lot at the yeah. same time. But it would have been really cool to sit down and do this like face to face. Yeah. If, maybe it was two weeks, you know, it would have been right, more right. feasible. But yeah, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun, and it it was basically what we would have done anyway. We were going to sit around <laughs> and listen to the record and sort of. Mm -hmm pat ourselves on the back and enjoy <laughs> the fruits of our labor. Yeah. But I think that's such an important part. It, oh, it, sure. It, I don't know if maybe in the past I would have felt that was like, I don't know, uh, kind of like lame to <laughs> celebrate. But uh, I mean, it's a, it's a huge accomplishment, right? It, it I think any time yeah. anybody finishes anything, like you really should like, yeah. make a big deal out of it because it yeah. is a big deal. Right. Like, it, I was playing it cool, like, yeah, yeah, we did it. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> no, like, yep. these moments are so few and far between. And it yeah. also just inspires you to get at it for the next one. So, absolutely. Yeah. There's so many interviews out there where I've, I feel like I've read or heard artists talk about how they never go back and listen to their own music. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not like putting on my stuff all the time, but I'll happily, like, you know, when the nostalgic itch, strikes me go back and listen to something and uh yeah i always i always worry for the folks who who don't want to hear what they made ever again like you got to go back and appreciate yeah. it right like you know even if you listen and you might do a dozen things differently now you still it's still an accomplishment and something to be uh to be enjoyed you know what i kind of like that feeling yeah. actually yeah when i when i listen back and say oh man like those drums don't sound so yeah good. i could be much better at that marks your kinda growth of, right <laughs> yeah, I'd yeah. I'd kind of feel like if I listened back to something old, I was like, "That's way better than anything I've done." That would be I'd depressing. Feel a little bad. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, I'm the same way. I listen to like things I'm working on yeah. and, in my car rides, and mm -hmm. um, go back and just get some perspective on what I've done. Um, I don't usually like to do it with other people, though. I sure. guess. Yeah, yeah. It's more yeah, of a true. solo. It's a, thing. it's a solitary activity. Yeah. But um, I think that's, you know, that's part of the reason we make music is so we can hear it, right? So Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I think it's... Uh, if you're not making stuff you want to hear, then uh, yeah, unless somebody's yeah. compensating you really well, yeah. <laughs> why are you doing yeah, I guess, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there's a lot of other things in life to do. 
Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Um, I know. Let me see here. We've got a few places we can send people. We can go to LanierSalmons.com. I'll spell Absolutely. that. Yeah. L a n i e r s a m n o n s. And I'm gonna put that in the show mm -hmm. notes too. Um, that's dot com. There's SoundCloud, which I'll connect to that. And I see from your Instagram, you're a fellow dog lover. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Two tiny so, ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too. That's cool. They look very cute. They look like they they have a lot of fun. Um, I'm, I'm like that too. I got my <laughs> my coffee mug with my. Oh, nice. Is that yours? <laughs> No, that's that's not them, but it looks like one of ours actually. Nice. Yeah, the one that's right behind me here. We do. We have a, a a Potter friend that made two mugs with our dogs' faces on them. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, that's like always an easy gift for my wife. I just get <laughs> nice. like the dog on something, and <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but cool, yeah. So yeah. we'll encourage people to go there to check out your work. Thank you so much. Appreciate um, it. Yeah. And then to find your track on possibly October 23rd. If not, mm -hmm. we'll we'll switch it in the show notes so yeah, that people we'll know when. But active or pre-save link there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll yeah. get something in there. And uh, nice. this is a lot of fun, man. Yeah, appreciate it's great it. To Thank catch you up. so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'd, hey, I'd love to hear about how things are going towards the end of the sabbatical, maybe, uh, yeah. or after sure. you're done, and maybe so. I'll hold you accountable. <laughs> sure, absolutely. That's always good. <laughs> you better have something to show. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, or maybe if you just have like a nice tan, that would be okay too. <laughs> <laughs> That's an accomplishment too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool, man. So yeah, thanks for coming on and absolutely. thank you, the listener, for tuning in. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.